All right, so, get for the program, they still can. All right, enough preamble. I think at this point we can get rolling. So today we're taking what we learned last week about very early primitive uh, medicine leading up to the Renaissance and early Enlightenment era, and we're moving into how people actually conceptualized disease and states of health during that time and all the way up to the present day. So our background from last week will help us out as we kind of run from there up to right now. Um, as always, go ahead and interrupt if you guys have any questions. I don't have the chat open on the screen, although I can probably get it open on my phone. But if you're wanting to ask a question, please don't hesitate to actually just speak up and let me know. And good, let's get the teams up on my phone. All right, perfect. So I should be able to keep up with the whole crowd as we go. All right, so we talked last time about how disease classification was a major effort on a lot of societies, especially the Islamic empires and the uh, kind of proto-scientists and physicians who were working in those empires. The humoral theory of Hippocrates leading into Galen was what was thought to cause disease, but how the humoral balance actually got disrupted was something that people really didn't understand. So the theories on why people got sick, why their humors got imbalanced, uh, one went with miasma. Bad air would cause the inhalation of it would affect the humors, get them out of whack and make the person unhealthy. Contagion was a very loose idea that disease spread from person to person. And it really wasn't any better defined than that, just that it tended to roll from person to person on occasion. As always, spiritual judgment, the idea that you were being cursed or judged for something you did or your family had done causing disease held on for a very long time. It's actually still around. Humoral imbalance for reasons of just bad luck, your uh, occupation, the environment around you could Im imbalance it were all things that were brought out as possible causes of disease. And always bad diet was in there as well. So we left off with uh, Andreas Vesalius and William Harvey. Now Vesalius published quite a bit about anatomy, but he did quite a bit of research about diseased organs and the states that they were in. But when he had what we'll call a, an academic hissy fit and burned all his notes before he left Padua, all that information was lost. And even if he wanted to follow up on it later, he was unable to do so. And we really don't know anything about what his theories on disease would have been building off of accurate ana anatomy. So the first name that we have in terms of actually classifying disease, which will lead us to our modern science of pathology, is Girolamo Fracastoro. And he did something that I really would like to challenge everyone in this room to do which is he accurately described a disease for the first time, but he did it in a poem. He had a poem that he wrote about a shepherd named Syphilis. And Syphilis was cursed by Apollo to become ill. And in the process of writing this poem, he actually did the first very accurate description of the progression of and the uh, effects of the disease Syphilis. So if uh, Comlex and our classes here are just not challenging enough for you, I challenge you to uh, put it all into long form rhymed poetry and we'll see how that works out. Now, next up, we have uh, Gene Fresnel, and he really took a lot of his medical practice and then deduced the causes of disease from it. He split the medical um, kind of classifications that he had in ways that don't make much sense to us now, but at the time they were at least interesting. He would try to split them into diseases that affected the body above the umbilicus and below the umbilicus. How things were either special or localized in one area or diseases that were more general like fever, rash, and so forth. So even though it was a strange classification by our contemporary standards, it was very sim uh, systematic and had quite a bit of influence on subsequent people studying the state of disease. Now, anatomy continued to develop after Vesalius, and that was going to be very prominent in Italy, but also moving into France, Germany, and the Netherlands. Uh, one guy called uh, Marco Aurelio Severino had a very interesting observation, and it was uh, that he had the opposite problem that we have these days. His complaint was that there were just too many fit young criminals 
being um, condemned to death and then dissected, and they never got a chance to actually dissect the bodies of those with long-standing disease. And so he was of the opinion that examining people who have died of some disease of long-standing would be much better for the development of medical research because it would actually give some light into what had killed these people rather than younger people who had been killed after being condemned for various crimes. Now, I think about what we have happening today. Now, we generally have older donors. Many have uh, not just one, but several disease states actively at progress. And we get to see that in the anatomy lab, whereas then that was not the case. So it's an interesting juxtaposition that they had. Now, this guy is uh, one of the French contributors, Franciscus Silvius. Actually, pardon me, he was not French. He was going to be coming from Italy, but worked at Leiden. And he came up with the linkage between biology and chemistry for the first time. And so he built off of William Harvey's idea of that the blood circulates, but also brought chemical reactions into the idea, believing that some illnesses were actually chemical imbalances. And right, up, right there on the bottom paragraph, he believed that acidic and alkaline elements were normally balanced in the blood and that disturbance of the system would cause disease. And he's absolutely right. So take a look at the quick little meme here I saw to uh, summarize what we now know about uh, Silvius's idea about acidic and alkaline control of the blood and enjoy that. And as we go into respiratory and the renal course, especially you first years, get used to thinking about whether something is alkaline or acidic and whether it's going to be controlled by the kidneys or by breathing. Now, we mentioned William Harvey a little earlier. He was the guy who came up with the idea that the blood circulated, pumped from the heart to the lungs, from the lungs back to the heart, from the heart out to the body, and then back through the veins. But he had to hypothesize the existence of capillaries. And it wasn't until early microscopes came along that people were actually able to validate that hypothesis. And uh, Marcello Malfighi was one of the people who first applied the microscope to medicine. Antoine von Leeuwenhoek were all, uh, was also involved, as well as um, you know, um, several people in the Royal Society of England at looking at biological substances and actually figuring out what their microstructure was and finding new things. And here's actually a picture of some frog lungs that Malfighi had drawn to demonstrate the existence of the capillaries connecting arteries to the veins. Now, moving a bit more towards what we consider actual pathology in its contemporary state, we had compendia of disease starting to get assembled, meaning large books collecting descriptions of disease. And the first one of these that really kind of became notable has made, it wasn't uh, a landmark in medicine for reasons I'll describe in a minute, but it has maybe the greatest name of any medical text ever. Sepulchritum sive anatomica practica et cadaveribus morbo denatis. So basically collection of practical anatomy and cadaveric uh, anatomy of disease. And these volumes of this book by uh, Theophile Bonetti described and traced the development of disease and postulated some of the causes, but the problem is there's no organization to it. They're not organized in any kind of coherent way, so you'd have to just flip through this book to find anything that's going to be useful to you at all. What was a nice step forward was a very similar effort by a guy named Giovanni Battista Morgagni in Italy, and he came up with another book, which has another equally amazing name, on the seats and causes of disease, or decedibus et causis morborum. And essentially, he did the same sort of thing, but he had very, very comprehensive descriptions of patients that came into the hospital, how their disease developed, when they died, and under what circumstances, and then the findings on autopsy. So he was actually able to follow it through that entire process. And what he found was that it was not an imbalance of bodily humors inside the body that was the problem. It wasn't some sort of coldness or hotness. It was actually diseased organs. He was actually able to describe many contemporary versions of diseases that we know now back then. And the most important thing he did with this book, it's huge, by the way, 
is he had a very comprehensive index drawn up so that if you had a patient with fever, you could flip through your decetibus, look at fever, and try to find all the descriptions that fit with it and try to compare the progression of disease with your patient and have some idea how you might be able to deal with it. Now, that didn't really help a great deal with treatment, but as it says on the screen, this was something that started to put an end to the dominance of humoral theories of wellness and disease. Essentially, organs were what he found to be responsible for the disease states, not these overall bodily fluids. So we move a little bit forward to the French Revolution. And one interesting side effect of the French Revolution that had a lot of negative things associated with it had one or two positives. One of the positives was that the French academic and medical system, which like everywhere else in Europe was very hierarchical, very aristocratic and very closed, was suddenly thrown wide open. In fact, the people who had been seen as um, previously authoritative, previously powerful, were literally kicked out of office and often killed. And other people, younger, more willing to experiment, were brought in. Now, I'm not saying that that makes the French Revolution a good thing overall. However, it did cause a massive increase in experimentation and willingness to question established um, truths in France at the time. Uh, however, one of the major things that went wrong in the history of science with the French Revolution was that Antoine de Lavoisier was actually guillotined because he was well connected with the aristocratic power structure of France prior to the revolution. Now, because of that shift and that willingness to innovate in, Fran in France, French pathology became very, very well established and most of the names you're going to hear about for the next few slides are all coming from France and I did never I never took French in high school so those who did bear with me as I attempt to mangle the names of these guys so on the left here we got Marie Francois Xavier Bichon and in the middle Jean Crouvalier and they took another step uh, forward with what Morgani had done Instead of looking at the organs, they started looking at the individual tissues that made up the organs with microscopic anatomy and very nice visual references. So Cruvalier actually came up with this, this picture is from his atlases of pathologic anatomy, and we can see the pericarditis here, the growths on the pericardium, the heart itself, as well as the pericardium, describing the problems that occur. And what the French pathologist at this time came up with was that it wasn't necessarily organs as a whole that were diseased, but sometimes individual tissues of the organs would become diseased. Now, at the same rough time, we're going to revisit England and Dr. John Snow, who we met last time. Nope, not that John Snow, this John Snow. Any Game of Thrones fans in the audience will know very well that this John Snow knows nothing, but this John Snow knows some good stuff of laughter normally in the classroom and I'm just sitting in my quiet little lab space so I'm just going to imagine that killed and we'll move forward so the important thing that's happening in England at this time especially connected with Jon Snow oh there we go thank you for the chat people I, I, I live for it basically is this was one of the first instances where miasma was firmly put down as a cause of disease John Snow was present when there was a massive cholera outbreak in the south of London, and that area was relatively poor. It was thought that the disease was caused by bad air coming off the Thames, which was horrendously nasty because it was essentially an open sewer for all of London at the time, and that's why people were getting sick. But he noticed that there were very strange patterns of the disease where people would get very ill in one local area, but other people nearby where the air was just as foul would be completely unaffected. And essentially what he did, uh-oh, didn't mean to move to that link. What he did was the first modern epidemiologic study. He actually went from door to door figuring out where the disease was hitting. He tabulated how many people died at each area. That's what the size of these blocks are. And the actual map he used was, or he created was even more amazing. He localized the outbreak to a pump in Broad Street. It was a pump that was especially renowned for clear, drinkable water, but it had gotten infected with uh, cholera. 
And he actually built this map of the outbreak, but also made an outline around it showing where the uh, foot traffic to the pump was shortest and longest and showed that people within a certain radius where it was closer to the broad pump to walk would be more likely to come down with the disease. And so he essentially figured out that the contaminated drinking water was the problem. And his investigations led them to look at the pump. It was decreed that it was okay. But then he kept on pushing them and they found that the bricks lining the pump had actually rotted out and a massive, just basically open pit of human waste was behind it and it was seeping out into there. And it not only stopped the outbreak when that pump was shut down, but prevented further outbreaks, which were just about ready to start because there were more people with cholera having their waste drained into that, that, uh, that cesspit. So this was the first modern epidemiologic study, and we're going to see Jon Snow again. But before, we're going to jump into the continent, to Vienna. Now, Vienna was a very progressive medical establishment, and they built in Vienna this massive hospital called the Algaminis Krakenhaus, and it says it right there on the screen. It brought in 14,000 patients yearly. Now, hospitals at the time were still places you wanted to avoid if you had any possibility of doing so because treatments were very primitive, technology was almost non-existent, but if you had a chance to recuperate and rehabilitate in a clean area, you might be okay. And newer hospitals like this were thought to be places that could happen. Now, one problem is that you have an incomplete understanding of disease, but also a wide variety of people treating the patients. Now, the person in charge of this uh, hospital was actually doing pathology there, and this is Karl Rakitansky, and he was a very well-known, very influential, and very capable pathologist who examined the people coming through the hospital for their disease states, wrote up the findings, the progression, and findings of the autopsy. Uh, one of my favorite uh, little bits of trivia about the history of medicine is this is Karl Roktansky and this is Mad Max Roktansky. Mad Max and the Mad Max movies are in honor of Karl Roktansky. The guy who directed and wrote all the Mad Max movies, George Miller, is actually a doctor. He financed the first Mad Max movie by doing extra shifts at the ER and that's how he was able to make the movie. And there's lots of fun little medical um, trivia things plugged into Mad Max. Like when he breaks his leg, that's fairly realistic. He's got a blown pupil from other things that have gone wrong. I think in the last one, Fury Road, they had to decompress a tension pneumothorax in the movie. So just more fun right there for you. But let's keep on moving. One problem that was occurring in that uh, hospital, the Algaminis Krakenhaus, was that the obstetrics wards, there were two of them, one was staffed by doctors and one was staffed by midwives. The one staffed by midwives had roughly a 3% mortality rate associated with the women who would give birth there. But the one that had, was staffed by doctors had between a 14 and 20% mortality rate of women who gave birth there. And the explanations for why this discrepancy were very much based on miasma. They were saying that the side that the doctors were in was closer to the river, it got more bad air. If they flipped it, the midwives would have worse outcomes. However, one of the doctors working there, a Hungarian man named Ingdatz Semmelweis, didn't really buy it. He didn't think that was the cause. He actually thought there was a more likely cause of it. And it wasn't bad air, it was contagion. He believed there were contagious particles that were infecting the women and clinging to the doctors, and the doctors were spreading the disease to the women in the obstetrics ward. Now, this is pre-rubber gloves, this is pre-hand washing, and nowadays it's obvious that that's exactly what happened. In fact, I'm amazed that the um, mortality rate in this ward was not higher than it was, because the physicians would autopsy deceased patients in the morning, patients who had likely died of infectious disease, barehanded, go upstairs, no hand washing, and do pelvic exams from bed to bed to bed to bed in the obstetrics ward. And that would cause massive, what was called puerperal fever, or childbirth or childbed fever, that would eventually cause sepsis and infections of the uh, reproductive tract. So Semmelweis, figuring this out, was able to institute a hand washing policy with a light, not quite bleach, but a kind of a chlorine solution. And immediately the 
um, level of mortality dropped to roughly 3%, the same as in the midwives ward. Now, you would think that this would be hailed as a massive step forward. But unlike France, where we'd had the revolution, the um, Austri Austrian society was very hierarchical, very authority based. And being a younger doctor and very much kind of bucking the trend and bringing his supervisors to the unhappy realization that they'd likely been killing their patients, he didn't make many friends. And as soon as he left, his advances were pretty much tabled, put away, and the mortality rate jumped right back to where it was. Now, one of the tragedies of this situation is that he really did find this uh, discovery in a timely way and could have saved many lives. And it's not fair. Supervisors and the authorities at the time didn't embrace it, but he was also an incredibly poor communicator. He had this insight, but he was not good at conveying it in a way that people would want to listen. He was argumentative. He kind of didn't you know, really push his case well. And after he left, he actually did develop some dementia. And the theory, not theory, pardon me, the old wives tale about him is that when he was in an asylum, he cut his finger and died of blood sepsis, which was the sort of thing he had actually tried to prevent in the hospital. Uh, subsequent pathologic examinations have actually pretty much shown that he was probably beaten to death for being a combative patient in the mental institution where he was institutionalized. So kind of a very tragic story for Ignaz Semmelweis, not only for him, but for all the women who could have been saved had his um, hand washing regimen been adopted by the hospital. It was eventually after the people who were his supervisors eventually retired, died, moved on, and his younger contemporaries who'd seen the benefit of the hand washing were able to get positions of power. Now, Vienna, despite this regimentation, was one of the hotbeds of scientific development We've seen how organs became a site for disease. We've seen how tissues became a site for disease. Now we're going to make the next logical step and look at how cells going bad can result in disease. And this is where it happened in Vienna. And we've got a nice litany of brilliant people whose names you'll mostly recognize. Not probably the first. The grandfather of it, Johannes Peter Mueller, was able to figure out that benign and malignant tumor cells were actually the same thing. They were just modifications, that the tumor cells were not invasive or pathogenic in the sense that they were invading the tissues and taking them over, but they developed from normal cells. This was the first time that had been understood. Now, he trained several people, a guy named Schwann. You may remember him from Schwann cells. He was the person who showed that animal tissues are actually all made from cells. And he got this idea from a friend of his named Schleiden, who was a botanist who discovered the same thing for plants. So again, the microscope is not only useful here, it's becoming essential. Now, next up, we've got Henley, AKA the loop of Henley. And he's the person who's responsible for all the fun terms you guys get to use now, like squamous, stratified, translation, transitional. Henley and his magical loop in the kidney for all the histology terms that you guys now have to figure out. Now, last and not least, we have Rudolf Verkow. And I really don't even know where to start. So we're just gonna jump to the next page. And I want you guys to take wherever you are a deep breath because you're about to feel incredibly insignificant. So, Rudolf Verkow, the father of cellular pathology, at 22 studied under Mueller, became an assistant prosector doing the autopsies at the Charité Hospital in Berlin. And in age 24, using the microscope, he identified and figured out what leukemia was. That's pretty cool. Then he graduated from medical school. Now, at that point, he had to found his own journal, a journal that is still in existence, simply to update people about what his findings were. He had a journal pretty much for himself and his friends, but mostly himself, because he couldn't get other journals to publish his work fast enough. So he did some um, public health work reporting on a typhus outbreak and basically came to the conclusion that it wasn't miasmas, it wasn't other things that were causing this typhus outbreak, it was the terrible hygienic conditions and poverty that caused the outbreak of typhus. And being a very forceful personality, he keep, kept on hammering that home until he really wore out his welcome in Berlin and was sent 
to a professorship further away in Würzburg, basically told to go away because he was being too irritating about, you know, trying to get better hygiene and better uh, civic um, facilities for the poor. Now, after many years in Würzburg, he came back to Berlin as the chair of pathological anatomy and director of pathology at the hospital and essentially just worked and discovered many, many things. And you'll hear his name a lot, but one thing that's really impressive is as much as you hear his name in medicine, he wrote just as many papers in anthropology. And in fact, a lot of anthropologists are sometimes a little surprised to hear that Verkow uh, was productive in some other field besides anthropology. He basically pushed for Berlin's sewers to go from being the worst in Europe to some of the best. He really pushed hard to make sure that public health was not a contributor to people's states of disease. He was also elected to the Reichstag and served as a progressive, uh, can not candidate, but a progressive uh, legislator there. And uh, the reason we have this picture here is that he was uh, very forceful and progressive in his opinions, and he alienated the uh, chancellor. And so the chancellor basically challenged him to a duel and uh, said that he wanted to fight Verkow. Verkow had two responses. He said, well, maybe if we fight with scalpels, I'll do that. And uh, he said, failing that, I'll inject some typhus into uh, one of two sausages and we can each eat one of the sausages and whoever dies will uh, be the, the one who fails the, the duel. Um, Bismarck did not go for it, so Chancellor Bismarck continued to live on despite uh, his challenge to Verkow. And last but not least, he just happened to be around when the city of Troy was discovered. So, yeah, if anybody can equal Verkow's uh, accomplishments before you kick the bucket, I will be incredibly proud of you. So go forward, do, do amazing things. Equally amazing is our next uh, person who was not, in fact, a physician at all. He was a chemist, Louis Pasteur. But Louis Pasteur became the person who made germ theory accepted. And he did this through a combination of persistence, good communication, and just mind bogglingly pro uh, productive experimentation. Idea Campus Verkau Day hot dogs. I'm in minus the uh, minus the typhus injections. So back to Louis Pasteur. He observed the fact that there were germs when he looked at things under the microscope and that they differed from each other. There were different varieties of them. And it was his knowledge of microscopic chemistry and looking at these germs, which at the time were called animolecules, that allowed him to figure out that when the French wine industry was having a massive outbreak of bad wine, that the, the, the compromised wine batches were in what we would now call a bacterium, whereas the good ones had yeast in them, and he was able to come up with a way to kill off the bacteria so that they wouldn't go bad. And if you've ever had something that was pasteurized, you have also been enjoying the fruits of that. So pasteurization basically allows you to kill certain bacteria while allowing the foods to not be completely compromised. Now, I will be the first person to say I've had unpasteurized mozzarella cheese and oh my God, it is the best thing ever. But I don't know if I want that to be the standard out there because pasteurization has saved many, many lives. He did the same thing for the French silk industry. Basically, there was a disease affecting the silkworms. He was able to find that there was a bacteria involved and come up with ways to treat that and also quarantine the silkworms that were ill. Now, part of this was that he was able to go on record as saying that Things don't rot unless they're exposed to these bacteria, these animolecules, and that spontaneous generation doesn't happen if you sterilize things beforehand. Before Pasteur, people assumed that flies just kind of came up from rotting matter. They were animals that had a life cycle. They were spontaneously generated by rotting meat, rotting material. I think another theory was that mice were somehow created out of straw and he showed that if you sterilized these structures, nothing would grow from them and that you would not have anything rot if you sterilized it prior and didn't allow dust or air to settle on it. So there we go, Louis Pasteur and the microscope, giving us germs and the germ theory of disease, pretty stellar, but wait, that's not all. He also, let me back up a little bit, was involved in the rabies 
vaccine. And that's going to be a topic we discuss when we get to treatment next week. Now, once we had the idea that bacteria, or again, animal molecules at the time, could be creating specific disease states, people started looking for which bacteria were tied to which disease. And the big name here is Robert Koch, who came up with the identification of anthrax and the specific bacterium that caused it. And he came up with a set of four postulates that would allow people to basically be very certain that a specific disease was caused by a specific organism and no other. So once again, it's not humoral imbalance that's causing disease in this case. It's an active invasion by a pathogenic organism from the outside. Now we're going to jump topics just a little bit now because I essentially don't have any better transition than this. But in addition to disease from the inside of the organs, the tissues, the cells, disease from the outside from invasive bacteria, states of health and wellness were also thought to be reflected in people's physiognomy or basically what they looked like. And the most prominent version of this was called basically phrenology. And you may have seen these models before, basically showing where the different mental quote unquote organs were that led to different traits or different personality propensities, different actions and so forth. And it was basically thought that if your mind was overly developed in one side, in one way, that would reflect in little bumps on the skull that the phrenologist could then kind of palpate and then describe, oh yes, you've got a very developed spiritual center, et cetera, et cetera. Phrenology was very popular for quite a while, but this, you know, was very much based on nothing. And essentially it was discredited basically because it had no real evidence that made it work and was basically used as a way to simply uh, lionize European traits as obviously the best at the time because they were very much wanting to justify European colonization and, you know, basically take any other group of people that they could, and I say European, I should say Northern European, because everybody else was considered to be phrenologically inferior. And this is one example of how science was used to justify the systemic, um, I want to say racism, but also just even more broadly bigoted behavior of people at the time. And it won't be the last time we see science used in such a way. Now, because phrenology was so massively disproven and, and so very much taken aback by most uh, respectable scientists, the view then became the opposite, is that mental processes were very diffuse and they were spread throughout the brain. So this globalist view was that you don't have regions of the brain that are going to have specific functions. Now, thing is, phrenology was not completely wrong, it was mostly wrong, but there is actual localization of many functions in the brain. So globalism, the reaction to phrenology, was wrong as well. Now, these differences in localization do not leave imprints on the skull to show us that we're, oh, I'm more mathematically gifted, or you're more of a literate person. Those differences in the brain are not going to be localized in overgrowth of it, but in the connections within it. Now, localization of function was proven in some fairly uh, dramatic ways. So in 1848, Phineas Gage was a railway worker uh, who was basically a uh, foreman, and they were drilling holes in the, in the rock to blast it to build a railway through. And one person would come in, drill the hole. Another person would come in, fill the hole with gunpowder. Another person would come in, fill it with a little bit of sand. And then the next person would put a little bit of cotton wadding in there. And then last, Phineas Gage would come with a big, basically not a crowbar, but a straight stick with a pointed end, tamp it down, and then they could blow it. And the explosion would go into the rock rather than up. Well, the guys in front of him missed a hole. And the gunpowder was there, but nothing covering it. So when his tamping rod hit the gunpowder, it blasted the rod through his skull, through his orbit, through his frontal lobe, and out the top of his head. What's amazing is not only did he survive the injury, he survived what I would imagine to be an almost inevitable infection after the fact, but he was never quite the same person. 
A lot of descriptions of it say he was basically a wild man who had no self-control. That's not completely true. He was able to hold a job. He actually drove a stagecoach in Argentina for many years. But he did suffer a massive change in personality and some disinhibition of his uh, functions. So he became more combative. He was more crude. He didn't speak as kindly to people. So there was definite evidence that there was a linkage to that brain injury and those higher functions that had previously been held to simply be a reflection of a person's spiritual self. Now, further evidence came in neuroscience investigations when we have neurologists like Paul Broca examining his patients. Now, his patients would come in with specific deficits, and then when they passed away, they'd be examined. And Broca discovered several patients who had language issues, what was called expressive aphasias. They could understand language, but they couldn't actually make language happen. And on autopsy, he found that it wasn't their overall brain that was shriveled. It wasn't any sort of inflammation everywhere. It was a damaged section of the brain just here in the frontal lobe, leading a little towards the temporal lobe. So that was a very clear localization of function evidence. Another related bit of evidence, somebody's not muted, so if you could just double check yourself real quick, is was found by Carl Wernicke. And Wernicke found that patients with a lesion further superiorly and posteriorly, where I'm circling here, had a different type of aphasia, where they could make language happen, but they couldn't actually understand it anymore. So at this point, we've got the globalist paradigm fighting it out with people who are saying like, hey, function is actually localized in different areas. And it wasn't until the, 18th, the 19th and 20th centuries when we had people investigating microscopic sections of the brain that they figured out that there was actually neural circuitry involved. So one guy whose name is going to appear a lot, Carmelo Gold, did a lot of microscopic investigations and actually developed a silver stain that allowed these neurons to stand out. Now, being a kind of a believer in the globalist idea, he believed that every neuron was literally connected to every other neuron. They were a complete syncytium, or they were completely fused to each other at the end of their cytoplasmic processes. A Spanish histologist, a guy named Ramon E. Cajal, did a lot of work with Golgi's staining method, but he came up with the conclusion that the neurons were in fact separated by tiny gaps, the synapse, and he basically took a lot of sections and very painstakingly moved his uh, focus up and down in the sections to kind of trace how the neurons spread out with what are now called their dendrites from their cell body and from their cell body out a single, usually, extension, the axon. So the two of them were, you know, I wouldn't say neck and neck competitors, because Cajal was kind of in Spain where it was kind of considered a scientific backwater, whereas Golgi was very famous. But their work, even though they came to different conclusions, was very um, persuasive, and they actually shared the Nobel Prize despite not really caring for one another due to their differing opinions on how the neural circuitry actually worked. Oh, and there we go. All right, so now I'm going to make another jump, and this time we're jumping back home, or at least closer to home, and we're going to talk about American medicine. Now, American medicine and pathologic study actually was doing fairly well early on. The American colonies were a fairly innovative place, and Philadelphia in particular was a really hot place to study medicine and try to get an education. Uh, this guy, Samuel Gross, who we're going to hear a lot more about subsequently, gave the first course on pathology, although he himself was a surgeon. Now, his idea was that surgery needed to be quick because the damage that caused infections, according to his theory, was due to exposure to oxygen. As tissues became oxidized, they became damaged and would be prone to forming pus and going bad and forming infectious material. Now, not a terrible hypothesis. Turns out not to be true, but it's not a terrible hypothesis to work from. And it was eventually debunked through the work of Joseph Lister, who we'll hear a lot about in the surgery talk. Now, American medicine was doing really well until the Civil War happened. The Civil War not only killed many, many people, it essentially bankrupted the country. It caused an economic downturn, and not only medicine, but most things in America started to become very stagnant and didn't go very far.
So at that point, what we have instead of some high status schools actually setting the tone for how medical progress is to go is we have a lot of proprietary schools. And these proprietary schools would basically just take in students, very minimal qualifications, very minimal education, and after several months or even less, you could go out, call yourself a doctor, and just start practicing the way that you'd seen you were practicing. And if your mentor didn't really trouble with certain afflictions and you then came across them, well, good luck to your patients. So that's how American medicine went from good to terrible. And it went from terrible to excellent, largely due to the founding of the Johns Hopkins School. And specifically regarding how this affected the development of disease understanding and pathology is linked with one of the founding faculty members at Johns Hopkins, a guy named William Welch. So the short story on the endowment of the Johns Hopkins School is that um, a railroad tycoon, Johns Hopkins, died leaving in his will quite a bit of money for the founding of the Johns Hopkins University and the hospital. But by the time they got ready to actually get going with the building of it, those stocks had decreased in value and they needed more money. Otherwise, the hospital could never open. They tried a lot of things. They came up with nothing. And so the wives and daughters of the board members decided that they would raise the money for the opening of the school, but some outrageous demands that had to be met before they would do so. One. Johns Hopkins, unlike every other American medical school, had to be postgraduate. People actually had to have a degree in something beforehand. Students were expected to read English, French, and German because that's where the findings in medicine and new discoveries were being published. The school had to be associated with a teaching hospital so that students would not just learn theory, but would also be expected to do rounds and get some practice. And the medical faculty at the school would not be allowed to have outside patients to distract them. They had to focus on teaching as their number one priority, even clinical teaching. And women were to be admitted on the same basis as men. Now in the chat, I'd like you guys to give me a quick answer. Which one of these outrageous rules do you think was the one that the board balked at the most? Which one was just un unbelievably crazy for them to ask for. I don't know if my chat's actually working now. Let's try again. There we go. Yeah, admitted. So thankfully, the board had no other options and they had to give in. The wives and daughters of the board raised the funds and women were admitted on the same basis as men, theoretically, in 1893. That's when the Johns Hopkins University opened. Now I underline 1893 because I'd like you guys to just swell with pride for a moment. The first school of osteopathic medicine opened in 1892. And even though this is a horribly pixelated picture and I can't find a better one, these were all the women in that first class. So not only did the first osteopathic medical school open a year before Johns Hopkins, it accepted not only women, but also Native Americans on an equal basis. So yay, osteopathy. Jumping back to Hopkins, and I'm not doing that uh, just to, to uh, get a quick diversion. For reasons we'll see in a little bit, osteopathic medicine got a very strong start, but was then very quickly um, put under the thumb of the AMA and development in osteopathic medicine and ed education really had an uphill battle thereafter. So jumping back to Hopkins, we mentioned that William Welch, one of the founding four faculty members, the guy on the left here, was a histologist who then got into pathology and he discovered the microbe caused gas gangrene. And it was originally called Welchia, now known as Clostridium perfringens. And he trained not only many students who went on to do great things, including Nobel Prize winners, but also assembled the rock star faculty in Johns Hopkins in those early days. In particular, a guy here, Halstead and John Osler, basically some of the most standout people in medical history who we'll be discussing shortly in other lectures in this series. So Hopkins was doing quite well. Now it was in Baltimore on the Eastern seaboard. The osteopathic schools were, however, more in the Midwest 
because American medical education and medical practice was overall just terrible. In 1910, the Carnegie Foundation asked a guy named Abraham Flexner to visit as many medical schools across the country as he could and basically come up with how medical education could be reformed. Now, at that point, he wrote his report, the Flexner Report, and the Rockefeller Foundation provided $50, and that's in $1910, so that hospitals and schools that wanted to remain open could adopt the Hopkins model, and all other schools were then regulated out of existence. Now, one quick thing about this, Flexner is the only person who wrote this report, and he was related to one of the faculty members at Johns Hopkins. So there's definitely some, um, a little bit of a conflict of interest going on here, but this is before anyone really considered that to be a really big deal. So the Flexner report had some effects that were good, some effects that were bad, and some effects that might be neither, depending on your point of view. Medical education in America became much more uniform and actually had quality control. Basic science and laboratory teaching were required in addition to clinical observation. So you couldn't do one or the other. You couldn't be a theoretical genius with no clinical know-how, and you couldn't be following your mentor from hospital to hospital while never understanding the basis of what you're actually studying. Now, the frauds and charlatans, the snake oil doctors who had been operating were pretty much put on notice that there was no longer going to be a free and easy way for them to just rip people off with garbage pharmacy. The American Medical Association became the dominant voice in medical education and they were not going to put up with any competition. So they got the ammunition through governmental regulation to attack competitors such as osteopaths and midwives. Midwives had been a very prominent uh, feature of medicine pretty much in the entire world but because of the ascendancy of the physicians, they were able to get them pushed to the periphery. And it's still a little bit difficult to find midwives these days. It's better than it used to be, but they were seen as competition, as were osteopaths. So the MD schools in the country decreased by nearly half, and the DO schools decreased. There were few of them to start with, but decreased even further from maybe eight to six. And one thing we'll bring up in the uh, last lecture in this series is that the uh, schools that allowed African-American students to join were almost entirely shut down. I think only two remained open after this. So it was also, the Flex Report not only made medical education more standard, uniform, and high caliber, it also made it more uniform in terms of backing up the AMA's power differential between who got to be a doctor and who didn't. Now, another thing that happened as a result of this is the funding for research to MD schools was much greater than any of the other competitors, and DO schools remained ineligible for any federal or state funding until the 1960s. So the fact that DO schools are still fewer in number than MD schools and don't have as much research infrastructure is largely a, a holdover from the Flexner Report's changes and the initial 50 years thereafter. Now, We've gone into the modern era, and at this point, we're leaving the realm of history and getting into almost what's going to be contemporary science. Molecular biology and genetics are fascinating, and what's especially amazing about them is the foundational events in this field all took place in less than two decades. So within about 15 years, we actually started developing some idea about how things at the subcellular level can affect our health. In 1940, a guy named George Beadle and Edward Tatum showed that protein structure was connected with genes. Now, we didn't know the structure of these genes, but heritable things were connected with protein structure and that those protein structures were passed down from parent to offspring. There we go. In 1944, Oswald Avery, and uh, working at the Rockefeller Institute, found out that genes are these inheritable things were somehow linked to DNA. Now, DNA had been kind of considered kind of cellular junk. It was just there. Nobody really knew what it did in the cell. It was just maybe kind of uh, the packing material of the cell. But uh, Avery actually was able to show that DNA, 
was the thing that had these uh, heritable units attached to it. And then in 1953, using what we will uh, call borrowed X-ray diffraction data from Rosalind Franklin, James Watson and Francis Crick were able to deduce the double helical nature of the DNA base pairs. Now, there's quite a bit of controversy about whether this X-ray diffraction data was given to them by Rosalind Franklin, stolen from her desk, and Rosalind Franklin died shortly thereafter of cancer and really never had a chance to give us her side of the story. So um, instead of doing an entire hour-long talk on that controversy, I'm just going to put borrowed in quotation marks and leave that open for future investigation. But what we now know is that the base pairs in DNA were the units through which heritable genes were kept. And in 1989, uh, Lop Chi Sui's team in Toronto found out that a specific gene, not a huge stretch of it, but a specific gene would get mutated to cause cystic fibrosis. And cystic fibrosis is the first disease that was actually linked to a genetic cause. It wasn't a problem with the humors. It wasn't a problem with the organ, the tissue, or even the cell. It was a specific gene that caused the specific disease. And we're still moving. I think we've got uh, CRISPR making life interesting right now, and I really hope that CRISPR turns out to be the miracle it seems to be, and very soon. One thing I will note is CRISPR right now is the thing that we're being told is going to cure all diseases, make us immortal, make everything better, cure cancer, and so forth. I've been alive long enough to see a few instances where we've had those same promises from the uh, Human Genome Project, things like that. And what inevitably happens is to get funding, these big initiatives and these new discoveries are touted as the next big thing that will solve all our problems. And inevitably we find out it's more complicated than that. There's things that they can and can't do. But by the time we're done, we're left with a much bigger toolbox. So just because the hype is hype doesn't mean it's useless. It just means you want to keep your expectations realistic when people are talking about the next medical innovation. And hey, if we're lucky, maybe it does turn out to be everything it claims to be and more. All right. Now that takes us to the end of what we have as how disease is thought to reside in the body or attack the body from outside. Next time, we're going to jump back in time and talk about how we actually tried to diagnose and treat disease throughout history. And this is where it gets very interesting in terms of just horrendously wrong-headed things that people used to do think it was somehow going to be a, uh, a vast improvement over someone's health to do horrendous, terrible things. So that will be next Friday. It's been a pleasure. And does anyone have any